This is The Wall Street Skinny, a podcast devoted to exploring the financial services industry and making the world of Wall Street accessible to everyone. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Wall Street Skinny with Kristen and Jen. Uh, This is Kristen here. I'm Jen. And as you guys can tell, I sound like a shell of myself. I can't believe you started laughing the second I started speaking. Um, I haven't heard you. I've been trying to communicate over the weekend and you were just like, I can't talk. I have no voice at all. Guys, I'm literally communicating via like charades with my children. It is insane. I feel like in that episode of The Last of Us, there's a character who can't hear. And so they they are writing things on a board. But of course, my youngest can't read. So (laughs) I'm drawing (laughs) things out with stick figures. I'm typing things on my phone and holding them up to my husband like it's just Aww. it's it's not a good look no, I'm so sorry guys no it's hard I mean because I've had that happen twice now one time after my bachelorette party we did I Vegas. remember Ooh. that <laughs> but I lost my voice for a whole week and I was so angry because I couldn't do my job I was supposed to teach and I wasn't able to for a whole week I mean it's it's just this horrible feeling of not being able to communicate it's awful so I really it I is, it is now this is similar to your bachelorette party this is totally self-inflicted so I cannot claim to be the victim here um but I was at my college reunions over the week and For those of you who don't know, Princeton takes reunions extremely seriously. (laughs) Most schools, you know, you go for your fifth or your 10th or maybe your 25th. Mm -hmm. A lot of people at Princeton go every single year, which is Mm -hmm. a huge commitment, especially if you don't live like in New Jersey or in the tri-state area. And I was not one of those people. You know, I went for the first couple of years after graduation and then I was going for the milestones. But yep. something changed for me after COVID, after being told I couldn't go to reunions yeah. for two years and my 15th was canceled. Same. I was mm-hmm. like, I'm never missing a year again <laughs> if I can help it. And here I am now mm-hmm. with the consequences. And just so you yeah. guys know, because we are so excited about this interview today, I literally, I like did not mm-hmm. speak trying to rest my voice. So yeah. this is the best I've sounded in 48 hours. <laughs> yeah. So by the way, I'm in Boston right now. Um, you can't necessarily see it. Jen Ken, my whole setup is totally different right now. We came up to Boston because we have to deal with all these logistics. We have to go interview nannies, the whole ahead bunch of, of your stuff, move, furniture related, mean. ahead of our move. We're moving in four weeks. And I hadn't seen my house since we saw it once and then we put an offer and I haven't seen it since. So we came up. I've been you still like parents. it? I do. I actually feel like I'm almost having a panic attack every time I go in though. I think it's because I'm really overwhelmed with the idea of moving out of New York. It's the weirdest thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy because we are crammed into this tiny little apartment and it's like, you would think that I'd be so excited about moving and don't get me wrong, I am, but there is something that is honestly scary and I feel myself just already almost like romanticizing New York City. We have this amazing house, five bedrooms. It's on this amazing street, walkable, everything that we wanted. And I feel so fortunate because the housing market still sucks. But like, there's so much change. I've been in New York for almost 20 years now. I mean, I can almost call myself a New Yorker. And we're now moving to the suburbs. I think it's just this adjustment. And I have mentally not realize that that is happening. I think I've been in denial. And so when I've gone in, it's a beautiful home. I love it. But it's just like, holy shit, it's feeling real. And it's freaking me the F out. So yeah. How else did you have a good rest of your Memorial Day weekend? Yeah. So we obviously we did the Taylor thing. So I, uh, mm-hmm. I I probably like way overdid it on our social media account. I was like putting up like video after video. I had 126 videos. I had a lot more I could have done, but I was just like, I don't want people to stop following us because they think, I think that we we're did spamming enough. them. I, I we did enough. enough. I know we did enough. No, it was it was so much fun. It's great. And your daughter had a good time. Oh my God. Yeah. The show was four hours long. She went on at like 730. She didn't stop singing till 1130. It was a long night. And honestly, my daughter was great. She's five years old. She was able to hang tight. And when Antihero, that was, I think the fourth from the last song. And then she started to fade because she saw her favorite song. And then she was uh-huh. sort of like, I'm tired now. <laughs> but we did. We stayed until we stayed till the end. And it was everything I thought it would be. And it was more. So I'm so happy for you. <laughs> so we should probably talk about what we have coming up for today today with yeah. Paul. So Jen, do you want to tell our listeners who we have today? Because this is a really exciting 
episode. Yeah. So, um, this is going to be the first of our interview episodes that airs the week that it was recorded because Mm -hmm. this fits in so nicely to, I think the timeline of walking you guys through various aspects of the industry. So today we're going to try to answer the question, what is a hedge fund? And a hedge fund is something that I think everyone knows what it is, but I, I think when pressed, very few people can actually mm-hmm. properly define a hedge fund, don't understand yeah. the actual mechanics of them, don't necessarily mm-hmm. understand their relationship relative to the rest of the market. It was funny because I was talking to you about this. I mean, well, I understand a couple of different types of hedge funds, so equity long short and convertible ARB. I was talking to my husband who has worked at multiple hedge funds as well, and I was just like, can you explain the difference to me of a traditional asset manager that does long only versus a hedge fund that does long only? And we're going to get into it with Paul, but these are these little questions that I think there's a lot of people out there that would not be able to answer that question. And and I was correct, one of them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because I think the perception of hedge funds in maybe the public sphere from people who aren't working in the financial services industry is that they're exactly like a traditional asset manager, just like meaner or yeah. more evil, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? There's, yeah. I do think there's this perception that hedge funds are ruthless yeah. in some way, shape or form in our culture. And I think so much of that was a function of the 2008 crisis. I think so much of that is a function of how they've been portrayed in, uh, in movies and shows. And I think we'll get into that. And yeah. we're going to be speaking with someone today named Paul Podolsky. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. When we get him on here, we'll ask him to correct our pronunciation. (laughs) In my mind, it's like Paul Podolsky, like Kelly Kapowski from Saved by the Bell. I don't think that's right. That's not how he spells it. (laughs) Yeah, we want to try to tackle that question. And Paul has just an absolutely stellar resume. He spent, I think, 16 years at Bridgewater, which is the world's largest hedge fund. And it's Mm -hmm. the world's largest hedge fund by an order of magnitude yeah. relative to the yeah. next closest hedge fund as far as assets under management. This is yeah. the giant- or AUM, yeah. Yes, exactly. This is the whale in the marketplace. And Bridgewater is also one of the oldest hedge funds. They've been around since the 70s. And I think mm-hmm. it's quite rare to find very many hedge funds yes. that have that type of longevity. Yeah. So this is really the category killer. And we're so excited to be sharing his expertise and understanding with you as our first entree into that arena. Paul has actually left the hedge fund industry and is now a podcaster (laughs) and a writer. (laughs) Um, So we're going to talk about his career arc and his path into the industry and also out of it to give you guys the full picture. But I think it's so interesting, Kristen, because I covered a lot of hedge funds during my career. I covered a lot of the biggest hedge funds, but Bridgewater was actually not an account that I covered. So I'm really curious to get an understanding from Paul directly from the horse's mouth. So we are joined here by Paul Podolsky. Did I pronounce that right? Perfect. Excellent. Um, and, and as I said earlier, Paul has just the most impressive resume, and we are so incredibly honored to have him on with us. And so, Paul, can you please give us a quick rundown of your work experience? And then we are tasking you with explaining to our listeners what is a hedge fund. Um, so first, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So uh, I grew up in uh, Washington, D.C., and I was just always very interested in how the world worked, which sounds like a pretty abstract thing. But for people who spent time in D.C., there's tons of foreign embassies. There were people there from all over the world. I grew up, I think I'm a little bit older than you two, so it was during the Cold War. The Soviet uh-huh. Union was out to get us. I just wanted to understand mm-hmm. how it all fit together. So uh, I went to college at Brown, and then immediately after that, I lived in Russia for three years as a foreign correspondent. Oh, that's so cool. I didn't realize you guys had the Brown connection, Christine. Yeah, I didn't Brown either. As well. I'm not yeah, sure how I missed go. that. So the year I graduated was the year the Soviet Union was collapsing. And wow. it became possible for the first time to go over there. And I really didn't know anything about investing. I studied history at undergraduate. Uh-huh. But I knew, and, and it sounds like 100 years ago now, but my father and his whole generation, they were the World War II generation. And they'd had mm-hmm. these very meaningful experiences when they were young. And I was looking for something like that. And so I went there and uh, expected to stay six months, stayed three years, but my wife had a kid. Uh, and then the reason that I realized the Soviet Union collapsed had nothing to do with what I'd studied in school. 
didn't have to do with Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, did not have to do really with missiles or anything like that. They had the wrong prices on things. It was that simple. I have never heard it phrased like that. And it was so simple once you were there that once you had the wrong prices on things, chaos Mm -hmm. ensued. Mm. In other words, if you tried to pay a coal miner the same as a heart surgeon, Uh it turns out that the price theory, it's not some (laughs) abstract thing. Like people will Mm -hmm. pay a lot of money to get heart surgery if they're going to die. And then from there develops corruption. And then the whole thing begins to uh, get really janky. And so I realized that the story that you needed to understand Russia had to do with economics. It didn't have to do with what I'd studied. So I went back and I got a graduate degree in economics at the Fletcher School. Uh And I still didn't really know much about anything. I sort of got a basic rubric for how economies work, but I Mm -hmm. had zero understanding for how markets work. And there's a big difference. Yes. I worked as a correspondent for two years for Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal doing the most medial thing you could, which was reporting on like copper, cotton, and foreign exchange. And Uh. literally it was like when you got slotted in this, when you were covering commodities, the reporter who had been there before gave you a pile of paper and it had names on it, and it was like Robbie, uh, Amex Futures, and you call. You didn't <laughs> you even have a last Robbie. name. You call up. You go, Robbie, what's going on? And he goes, We're bid. There's weather, and then he'd hang up the phone. <laughs> this is this is really before the internet, and you were like, How on earth does weather impact cotton? Well, if you know anything about agricultural commodities, it's obvious. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I didn't know anything, mm-hmm. so that was my right. introduction mm-hmm. to markets. Oh, that is so cool. And then I, you know, the stuff, and it was. If you read the C section of the Wall Street Journal, I don't know mm-hmm. how it's structured, but back then, that was where all the really boring, like many people find the Wall Street <laughs> Journal boring. The C section is like the boring of the boring. <laughs> and then I was like inside the most boring thing. So what happened? But it was a really good introduction to how those markets worked. And I began to pay attention. And mm-hmm. I found actually, particularly through foreign exchange, that you could really, it was like a cardiogram for the world. Mm-hmm. And you came in and you began to see all these things moving around and it sort of pulled you in. Mm-hmm. And I was fascinated. I uh, was married with a young kid on a basically a starvation salary mm-hmm. and got a job from one of my sources, which you're not supposed to do. But the, um, <laughs> he basically said us. he needed an analyst. And uh-huh. I jumped from being a reporter to working as an analyst in a bank. And we were covering foreign exchange and then interest rates. Were you on the sales side or trading side? I was a strategist. You were so strategist. we were basically oh, okay, providing the advice. And there I started, the compliance rules were not as stringent as they are now. So yeah. you were allowed to trade futures. I had no idea what a future was. Like in was your there. PA? Yeah. Oh. You were allowed, and there was no compliance or anything okay. like that. And so when I got there, I was so naive. I was like, okay, I see that the currency goes up and down, but how does anybody make money on it? And they were like, mm-hmm. well, you could buy a currency you thought was cheap, and if it goes up, you sell it, you'll make money. And I was like, got it. Now, <laughs> how do I do I didn't even really understand how a 401k or anything worked. Uh huh. And so I was like, well, how do I do that? And they were like, you open up a futures account, so you can't see on my wall, but I have my confirmed from my first futures trade that oh, I did. stop. That's amazing. And so one of the things that people ask about, how do you learn how to trade? And um, it's not easy because, first of all, it's mm-hmm. markets, not economies. And second of all, there's a huge psychological element to it. Mm-hmm. So the first mm-hmm. trade I put on was in our house, so we were already levered uh-huh. on the house. And one of your questions, I know you guys are interested in leverage. And Mm -hmm. we had very little money, and I bought a single future of Canadian dollars because I thought the Canadian dollar was going to go up based on the macroeconomic analysis we'd done. Okay, for listeners who know nothing about this, the smallest size you can buy of a futures contract is $100,000 notional size. (laughs) We had about $3,000 to our name. So I put this on with the utmost terror. Um, (laughs) I saved it. I made... $334 on the trade and I printed it out and I was like, okay, this is the beginning of my trading career. So I worked there for six years and that is the sell side. The sell side basically, for people to know anything about Wall Street, sell side is the big banks that you've heard of. It's people like JP Morgan and Bank of America. Basically, a bank is a toll gate. It's a toll gate. You cannot get through it without paying a fee. You want to deposit a loan? You want to deposit money? They give you very little interest. You want to borrow money, they charge you a lot. That's called a spread. A bag Mm -hmm. is just a gigantic toll gate. If you're a big corporation and you have profits in Europe and you want to bring them to the U.S., 
mm-hmm. because you're a dollar based company. Well, you got to pay a toll that goes through the foreign exchange tax. That's what I was doing. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we were just a gigantic toll gate. And I could tell you all sorts of funny stories about how that how that worked. And it was also during the time of the internet because you were getting pricing transparency for the first time, mm. which didn't exist before. So they used right. to be able to charge clients in ways they didn't know what the foreign exchange market was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the transparency led to narrow margins, led to a whole series of bank mergers, et cetera. It was clear to me that I wanted to get off the sell side and get onto the buy side. Uh-huh. But one of the very tricky things about Wall Street is it's like a caste system. Mm-hmm. And switching casts is super hard, even though if it's somewhat random. Like switching from being a journalist to a banker was basically luck. It happened for me. I got hired in August of 1998, which your listeners won't know, but it was the peak of the Russian financial crisis. Yep, what yep, was yep. the one thing that I knew about? Russia. Russia. <laughs> and right. so when they asked me questions like, what do you think is going on in Russia? <laughs> they were like, wow, this guy's really smart. It was the only country. The only thing you knew. If they'd asked me about the United States, I wouldn't have been able to answer. So then I, I was like, I need to switch on to the buy side. And I really want to be involved in a macro hedge fund because the macro hedge fund related to that original thing in D.C., which was how does the world work? How the world works, yeah. Yeah. And they're really tough to get a job on because most of them weren't hiring. And then one of them was Bridgewater was very small. It's now the biggest hedge fund in the world when I joined (laughs) it. Ray was the founder of it, was about my age now. He'd been struggling for 30 years. Is that right? He'd been working a long time. And it was just really beginning to grow. Mm -hmm. And he needed help. And he hired me. At the same time that a lot of other places would not hire me, who later collapsed. I interviewed mm. at Bear Stearns. They were like, you're too dumb <laughs> to take the job. And then Ray, the founder of Bridgewater, was like, you're perfect. So again, just changing your cast thing anyways. So I worked at Bridgewater for 16 years. What role did Ray hire you into specifically? It was also unclear. It Ah. was like, you're going to help me out. So You were a Swiss Army knife. (laughs) Exactly. Initially, Mm -hmm. I did basic, we can talk about how hedge funds work, but I did basically everything. I did research and I talked with clients. Um, And so there's, a hedge fund is good trades and happy clients. Love Mm -hmm. it. And that's where he put Mm -hmm. me in. So that was a long answer to your question. No, I love it. It's basically how it worked. Oh, I have so many questions off of that. Um, Great. But (laughs) so the first question that that I would like you to tackle is just, explaining to our listeners what is a hedge fund if you had to explain it to my grandma who spoiler yep. alert was not in the financial services industry yeah. <laughs> a very smart lady but had no idea what i did for a living how would you explain what a hedge fund is yeah it's i think it's totally a reasonable question and truth be told i had no idea either when i started my venture on wall street literally i used to read when i was in graduate school mm-hmm. i would read the front page of the wall street journal and i had financial economic dictionaries and mm-hmm. i was like mm-hmm. looking up all the words like yeah. what's that uh-huh. Like, what's yep. the difference between an equity and a stock? And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah. they're the same the thing. Same thing. Yep. Yeah. Trick yeah. question. Okay. <laughs> there's a lot of, There's a lot of that there. That's, 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 that's like what our podcast is for. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And yes. I think that it's a great podcast because oh, thank you. The, um, the third book I'm writing is about money. And I think the strange paradox with money is we all care about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a little secret. Mm-hmm. And the minute you start talking about it, most people are bored out of their minds. <laughs> yes, yes. So what a, what a strange mm-hmm. paradox. We all yeah, care yes. about it. Yep. But if you mm-hmm. start talking about it, people are like, oh, God. Oh, God, spare me. Yeah. Right. My, and that's why there's... Go ahead. I was going to say, my sister-in-law is a doctor, and my brother, her husband, works in finance, and she's like, every time he talks finance, just my eyes glaze over. Yes. Right, because yeah. she's saving lives every day, right? And yes. so, well, you know, but... <laughs> but yeah, yeah, and I, you know, a lot of the writing I do now is the same thing, because I feel like it is a powerful way of looking at understanding the world. And I think a lot of people want to understand. Mm-hmm. Yes, but yeah. because it's sort of wrapped in all the stuff, both terminology and a lot of contradictory, frankly, emotions, mm-hmm. there's a huge barrier. And so there's a lot of different ways of cracking through that. And I think what you guys are doing is good. Okay, so what's a hedge fund? A hedge fund is basically the idea is, listen, you're going to earn money in your life and you're going to save money. Mm-hmm. The way you save money is by spending less than you earn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're saving money because you want it at some point later in your life, like Mm -hmm. when you stop Mm -hmm. working. That's basically the financial life cycle. Now, the way the vast majority, certainly of Americans, save that money is by being invested in the stock market, Mm -hmm. which means that if the stock market goes up, they have plenty of money for savings. And if the stock market goes down, they could be in a lot of pain. 
mm-hmm. and I'm going to drop down a level more technical. If you look at the advice that like Vanguard or Schwab or any of those people will give you, the essence of the advice is to put, I'm just going to save a lot of money and then put that money, 60% of the money in the stock market and 40% of the money in the bond market. Of course, people when you're have to young. understand right, what, a, what a stock and a bond is. But mm-hmm. here's the thing. The stocks go up and down more than the bonds. Mm-hmm. So basically, mm-hmm. your entire retirement portfolio is what happens to the stock market, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which can be volatile, meaning that it could lose a lot of value. So why did hedge funds come apart? Markets have been pretty volatile in our own lifetime, but in the first half of the 20th century, they were even way more volatile. So my dad and my grandfather lived through the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. The U.S. stock market lost 9-0%, 90. Wow. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you retired in 1929 and you had all your money in the stock market. Right. Kaboom. Mm -hmm. You're in a low to hurt. And then that's just U.S. stocks. Mm -hmm. There was German stocks. Germany is a very advanced country, and you were completely wiped out by hyperinflation and then the war. And Mm -hmm. so putting all your money in stocks can actually, if you understand how volatile stocks is, is pretty scary. Mm -hmm. So the notion of a hedge fund is how can I get an investment return with my savings that's not entirely dependent on what happens with the stock market? And so the notion hedge is you've got something that is offsetting so that it's not related to the stock market going up and down. So stocks could be part of your savings plan. But the idea was, boy, wouldn't it be great to have something that doesn't necessarily lose money when the stock market goes down? That's the initial idea of what a hedge fund was. Mm -hmm. And since then, it's developed. That was sort of in the 1940s and 50s. And since then, it's developed into an industry with lots of different types of hedge funds, et cetera. But basically, it's a way to grow your money faster than the rate of inflation, that is unrelated to the basic peanut butter and jelly type of investments that you might have elsewhere. I like that. So for many of our listeners, we've talked about the difference between, say, a traditional asset manager and a hedge fund in the past. There are, I think, several key distinctions that we've touched on briefly. But if you had to explain kind of the key characteristics that differentiate between, say, a traditional money manager, a mutual fund where you are tracking an index and hoping to slightly outperform that index versus what a hedge fund does or can do, how would you describe those differences? I'd say it's like the difference between a bicycle and a fighter jet. Mm, I love that. Basically. They're both means of transport that you'll get you from A to B. Mm-hmm. Uh, bicycle's a lot simpler uh-huh. in terms mm-hmm. of getting you there. The fighter jet can go upside downs. It can do loops. It can do Mach 10. <laughs> and it can also crash into the side of a mountain really, That's really right. fast. That's right. I love so, that. So basically, when you are investing with a standard mutual fund, there's not very much they can do. Mm-hmm. So take the simplest possible example of that. Say you buy what's called an ETF, an exchange-traded fund. You give it to Vanguard Fidelity. They literally, there's nothing that you say, I want a, this investment with you to mimic the returns of the S&P 500. That's all it does. Mm-hmm. If the S&P 500 loses 20%, you lose 20%. If it goes up 10%, it goes up 10%. That's it. There's zero divergence. And they literally have tons of people inside there that are checking to make sure that that ETF you buy, that for instance, you know, if there's difference between individual stocks, there's a lot of mechanics behind there. They're actually checking and doing trades to make sure that ETF perfectly replicates is the mm-hmm. word what the index is. Right. Boom, that's that. A mutual fund opens it slightly wider. You could say, hey, listen, I'm going to be invested in all the stocks of the S&P 500, but I'm going to have a little bit of leeway. I could overweight some and underweight others. That doesn't mean you can make money from a price decline, but you just change the weighting slightly. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. what a mutual fund is. And a bond, a bond is basically a loan. There's different types of loans. The government borrows money. That's called a treasury. A corporation borrows money. That's called a corporate bond. But a bond is a loan. And if you invest in a bond manager, they also, they can just buy bonds. Mm -hmm. And they could diverge a little bit that they could buy as opposed to a three-year bond or a five-year bond. That's what a mutual fund manager is. So you're giving them some ability to manage money, but the reality is, is they can't do very much. Mm -hmm. And the reason they can't do very much is because beating markets is incredibly hard and you don't want to give them that leeway. Mm -hmm. And so basically the beauty is you know exactly what you're getting, like the bicycle. It'll get you there over really, really long periods of time, but it doesn't solve the original problem that the hedge funds were thinking of. Well, what happens if the stock market crashes? Right, right, right. right. You got you got no protection. 
Mm-hmm. And that's why there's all this, I call it sort of investment religion about like stocks for the long run, blah, blah, blah. Here's the news. Stocks for the long run works in one country and one country only. That's the United States. Correct. And it works from 1982 till now. Mm-hmm. If you choose the other time periods, it doesn't work so well. And so it's a nice calming thought that if you do it, things will work out well, but it's not accurate. And mm-hmm. if you look at the experience of Venezuelans or Chinese or Russians or blah, 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 or Europeans, there are also people trying to save for retirement and they've gotten crushed by that philosophy. So mm-hmm. I'm not a huge fan of it, mm-hmm. but I also understand that if you're a thoughtful person, you don't have time to do it. Like, what the heck do you do? It's actually a complex question. That's why money's a tricky topic. It's a little bit like love or relationships. There's not simple cookie cutter answers. Mm-hmm. You could give cookie cutter things like do unto others as you would do unto yourself. It sounds nice. <laughs> well, what does it mean to do unto yourself? Well, that's a very profound question. Mm-hmm. How do you treat yourself with that? Blah, 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 blah. So all those questions. Money's the same type of thing. I love that. And so you talked a little bit about the traditional philosophy of, okay, I'm, I'm an individual wanting to invest for my retirement. Yes. If I am a lay person listening to this podcast and I am not super wealthy, <laughs> yep. can I participate in a hedge fund? Who are the main clients of a hedge fund? You can't. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's for a good reason. So there's a whole bunch of regulations that have been developing over decades, really, to deal with all the financial crisis we've gone through. Mm -hmm. And I actually think they're a good thing. Mm -hmm. And um, they generally help people. Even the thing that most people regard as like the center point of the financial system, the Federal Reserve, the central bank, it's an invention. Mm -hmm. It's only about 100 years old. It was invented in 1913 after gazillion financial crises from the founding of the country up till that. And then they created it to try to Solve problems. It solved some problems. It created others, like all regulations. Mm-hmm. So the regulations for the typical investor is they can't get involved in hedge funds, and that's fine. So I'm not a financial advisor, but the basic the basic notion for a typical investor of hold a bunch of things that are unrelated, that are separate from one another, and just buy and hold over time, that's a good starting point. Mm-hmm. And even before that, really learning how to be frugal and save is also a good starting point. So those two things interrelate. I would say that's like, it's like diet books. I'll cut through like all of the money management books. Uh The diet books are basically like, don't eat that much, mostly vegetables. That's the essence of diet advice. And it's pretty good advice, but it's hard to follow. The essence Mm -hmm. of money books is spend less than you earn, (laughs) spread your bets, and let it compound over time. Good advice. But there's Mm -hmm. complexities beyond that. So who invests in these things? Who is sophisticated enough to invest in them? So it it depends a little bit on the size of the hedge funds, but I would Mm -hmm. say in the world, and this is a strange perspective on the world, there are large pools of capital. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the U.S. has a very fractured pension system, Mm -hmm. but a lot of places do not. Canada Canada. has an incredibly (laughs) sophisticated pension system. Australia has a very sophisticated pension system. So those pension systems have high levels of forced savings that produce pools of capital that are in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And not surprisingly, they have the wherewithal to be able to discern. So they would invest in hedge funds. Mm -hmm. Sovereign wealth funds, also something the United States doesn't have. The U.S. has a currency that just goes up and down. We don't really – everybody just thinks in dollars. The rest of the world doesn't think that way. And so there's many large countries who the exchange rate relative to the dollar, which is a whole other story, has a huge impact on their ability to do basic stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, import things, medicine, pay debt, really, really key functions. So these people have built up huge pools of capital. They're called sovereign wealth funds that are in typically in in dollars. Mm -hmm. And they would invest in hedge funds. Insurance companies sometimes could. Mm -hmm. So there are these large pools of capital. Some of them would be wealthy families. Mm -hmm. That could happen Mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So if you think about Bill Gates, Bill Gates is a wealthy guy. He has a foundation. That foundation is not alone. There's other sorts of foundations like that. If you listen to National Public Radio, you'll hear them say, was a gift from blah, 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 those types of people. And then endowments too would be Mm -hmm. another thing we'd Mm -hmm. invest in them. And some wealthy individual as well. But I don't know exactly what the rules. I think you have to have. You have to be an accredited investor. Um, which is like really, $5 million bucks or $10 million? Yeah, bucks. $5 million, I believe, in like liquid assets. Um, Correct. Yeah, I think that's it. So if um, you look at the typical savings of the upper 10% of U.S. households, it's $1.4 million based on the last Fed survey. 
So it's telling you that even the very upper echelons of wealth are not going to be able to invest in a hedge fund. That's exactly right. Um, That was so well explained. You know, one of the questions that we had was, what is the minimum investment size in a hedge fund? And obviously that is going to depend on the hedge fund itself. Correct. But for a hedge fund like Bridgewater, where you used to work, um, talking about like your futures contracts from from back (laughs) in the day, the minimum notional size. I love that, by the way. What would you say? I mean, just giving our listeners a sense of scale. Most people are, yeah. (laughs) And it depends. It's a negotiation. So basically money management is an incredibly simple business. You make Mm -hmm. money two ways. A, you make a fee on each dollar that comes in the door and Mm -hmm. the performance of that dollar. Mm -hmm. So you get that type of return. And B, the more assets you have, the more you make. So if you're Mm -hmm. a fantastic investor, but you manage a million bucks, that's great. But you could be doing the same thing managing 100 million bucks, and then the profits just scale. There aren't many businesses, sort of like software entertainment, that scale. Mm -hmm. Investing is one of them that does. So you can have the same people to do much more. So many of the managers are interested in growing. There are certain challenges with growth, but they do. And so what the minimum investment is very much depends on the life cycle of a fund. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about somebody who is just breaking out on their own, Mm -hmm. those people will take a hundred grand, anything to get money in the door. Mm -hmm. Once it's somewhat established, the minimums go up and up and up and up and up, and they can be in the tens of millions of dollars just to get in the door, which sounds like an extraordinary sum, but then, you know, go back to, you know, a large institutional pension plan that has $300 $300 billion, right, right. making a $20 million investment is not that big for them. That's exactly right. And then you talked a little bit about management fees. I think most of our listeners has probably heard about the traditional two and 20. Right. Um, can you discuss kind of what that is and what the different models might be that diverge from that a little bit? Right. So if you go out and buy a mutual fund, you will pay that company Vanguard a couple of basis points it's like a hundredth of a percent to mm-hmm. buy yep. a uh, buy a fund. So pretty modest fees. Mm-hmm. If you are investing not in the bicycle, in the fighter jet, then you pay the standard fee is 2% just on the money going in the door mm-hmm. and then 20% of profits. So mm-hmm. what does that mean? It means that if you give them a hundred bucks, you're out two bucks on day one. You're down mm-hmm. to 98 just, just when it started. Now, if they earn money above their target, say they're supposed mm-hmm. to earn 10% a year, if they earn 20, $20 that year, so they earn, to keep it simple, 120 bucks, mm-hmm. the difference between 10 and 20, they also get 20% of that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you're paying them four bucks on mm-hmm. that year that they hit their performance. So if you think about that whole thing, it's like you lost two bucks, then they earned 20, that got you 118, then you got, so it's 16 mm-hmm. bucks. Mm-hmm. So they're basically getting a quarter to a third of the return. Mm-hmm. So it's expensive. Yep. And the reason it's expensive is think about those times, and depends on the age of your listeners, but actually last year is a good example. Last year, stocks got hammered. 2008, stocks got hammered. Mm-hmm. 99 to 2001, they got hammered. You're paying for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the specific thing you're paying for, this gets a little bit wonky, is it's very easy to forget the power of a super simple thing in math, which is compounding. Basically, in terms of your investments, you really want to focus a lot on not losing money. Uh Why? Because you could have a really boring return, like 7 or 8% a year, with no losses, Mm -hmm. and it's compounding on a greater and greater amount. Now, if you have a volatile return, and you invest $100, and that manager's down to 50 Mm-hmm. You have to earn insanely high returns to get yeah. back to 100. Mm-hmm. So the reason why people would pay these monster fees to a hedge fund is with the hope that it'll make their losses less when terrible things happen, which is yeah. worth it to them mm-hmm. in terms of that battle of compounding. I think that's a great explanation. Um, and then... We've heard a lot of talk about different thresholds and hurdle rates within that payout model. Can you speak a little bit to how that works and how that can actually even increase the impact of how those profits get distributed within a hedge fund? It's a negotiation, basically. Mm. So the ideal for the manager is to have as few possible clients that are really large, Mm -hmm. because that's simple. That cuts their overhead. You know who Mm -hmm. you're dealing with. 
And the investor perspective is they want to pay the lowest fees possible, like as opposed to paying four bucks of that example, they pay two. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a big difference to your return. So it'll go back and forth. So the bigger the investment, typically the smaller the fees will be. Mm -hmm. And then there could be different gradations in terms of performance, how you structure them. The basic notion is, is the manager gets about a third. Got now, it. you could structure that different ways. You could say, hey, listen, I'm not paying you any performance fees, so no 2%. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. as opposed to getting 20, mm-hmm. I'm going to get 40. Mm-hmm. Got it. So then if the hedge fund manager has a really big year, mm-hmm. which is good for the client, they're earning sure. money, yeah. they are going to write a monster check. Got and it. the clients are people too. You know, They have boards of directors and they mm-hmm. look at the checks that are going out the door. Then you're like, holy mackerel, <laughs> what did you pay to this? And it's like, well, they earned you know, 50%. That happens. In a year when mm-hmm. everyone else was down yeah. five. <laughs> and every yeah. year when yeah. else was down, right? But And how yeah. many billions of dollars we pay? So those types of conversations mm-hmm. will happen. But it's essentially, there's a buyer and a seller and it's like tomatoes in the marketplace. Like you buy more tomatoes, you know, it's less per tomato type of thing. And if the tomatoes are really good, the price goes up a little bit. Okay, perfect. So let's talk a little bit about the actual trading that goes on at these places. Yes. You talked about Bridgewater being a macro hedge fund. Um, That is the distinction from other types of hedge funds. So in my world, in the interest rate sales world, we covered macro hedge funds, relative value hedge funds. Kristen, you used to deal a lot with convertible ARB hedge funds. We've got equity long short hedge funds, which we talked about as being what I think a lot of our listeners may think of as like the only kind of hedge fund that there is, Mm -hmm. not understanding the broader field. Can you speak a little bit about just what that overall macro strategy looks like? You know, you talked about wanting to understand how the world works, right? What does that look like as far as the different components of an investment portfolio? You'll probably have a little bit of fixed income, some equities, some credit, some FX, things like that. Can you you touch on that a little bit relative to some of these other guys? Yeah. So with all of them, the basic goal, again, is to get a return that's different from other things. Mm -hmm. And there's just Mm -hmm. different ways of doing that. And it's a little bit like a restaurant. Like there's Chinese food, you know, there's French food. There's just serving different meals. The question Mm -hmm. is, is the kitchen good? And is it different than what you're eating at home? That's basically it. In my house, for sure. It's better than whatever you're eating here. (laughs) So what is a macro hedge fund? Macro, first of all, the word means macroeconomic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea is... If you think of Warren Buffett, I'm going to simplify a little bit, but if you think of Warren Buffett buying specific stocks, Mm -hmm. so he's long Bank of America and Apple, Mm -hmm. those are all within one asset class, just Mm -hmm. equities. And he has got some international investments, but they're mostly just within one country, the U.S. Mm -hmm. He's basically picking just the few sectors. Mm -hmm. I talked about scale. Yep. He's limiting himself to the few sectors that make a lot of money. There's a lot of people working their butts off who don't earn money. Mm-hmm. And it's just structurally the nature of the business. And mm-hmm. so he is, that's what he's doing. But a macro fund is very different. And what they're basically doing is, is they're saying, listen, if you look out in the world, there is, first of all, very different economic conditions across country. Some countries are growing. Some countries are contracting. And then there's very different policy. Some countries have high interest rates. Some countries have low interest rates. Some countries have low inflation. Some countries have high inflation. Some countries export commodities. Some Mm -hmm. countries import commodities. So if you step back and think about the world, it's basically these massive money flows going one direction or another relating to the nature of those economies. And you can sort of go around the world and think, you know, what is the U.S. really competitive at? Well, it's really amazing at technology. It's got pretty good commodities, and it's good at exporting education. And basically, everything else is sort of a wash. You know, what is Brazil amazing at? Well, Brazil has an enormous amount of raw materials, particularly iron ore, that people need in the rest of the world, also soybeans. What is China at? China is the best manufacturer in the world. What does India have? It has cheap outsourced labor and a whole bunch of economy that are dysfunctional. Russia is basically, or it was before it got caught off from the system, it's basically raw materials, and that's it. And so as the world goes through these ebbs and flows and growth and weakness, it's going to affect all these different countries differently. Germany, Japan, unbelievable manufacturers. And so what the macro investors do is, first of all, developing a really accurate economic picture of the Mm -hmm. world, what's going on, then comparing that to the pricing of assets 
and then looking for things that are mispriced. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a classic example, which is right now there's an inflation problem in the United States. Mm -hmm. They've been raising rates like crazy to try and get inflation down. And at the same time, the stock market's been going up a lot. So you have this strange situation where if you look at U.S. stocks relative to foreign stocks, they look pretty expensive. There's reasons why we could get into, but just simplify. They look pretty expensive. And you have a central bank that's on a war path. Now compare that to Japan. Mm -hmm. Japan had a bull market in 1990 that they have still not recovered from. Mm -hmm. The crash was so bad. Mm -hmm. So the stocks are not nearly as expensive as U.S. stocks. And they have very little inflation Mm -hmm. compared to U.S. So in the U.S., they're trying to constrict the money supply. In Japan, they're not. So you have valuation differences, U.S. like this, Japan like this. And then you have monetary policy looks like this. And so what a hedge fund manager would do is look for an opportunity. They could say, listen, I'm going to sell the U.S. stock market. I'm going to buy the Japanese stock market. That is going to be a trade. Mm -hmm. My overall exposure to stocks is zero Mm -hmm. because I'm short one along the other. Mm -hmm. And if Japan outperforms the U.S., boom, I make money. And let me just look. If I look at this today, so where's my – So Japanese stocks are up 20% and the U.S. is up 9 Boom. That's how it works. (laughs) And if it was only so simple. There's a lot of other trades that don't work out as well. But that's basically what they're doing, and they can do it in anything. That's why it's a fighter jet. So they can trade They can trade copper versus rebar mm-hmm. and Australian dollars versus Canadian dollars versus Brazilian real versus Malaysian ringgit versus short-term interest rates versus long-term interest rates versus German interest rates versus British interest rates, blah, 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 blah. And basically what you're doing is you're thinking there's bond markets, mm-hmm. there's stock markets at an mm-hmm. index level like the S&P 500. Yep. There's commodity markets, and there's currency markets, Mm -hmm. and there's credit markets, and they're in all of that. Mm -hmm. And so that's why this is not for the faint of heart. It's What it works is a beautiful thing, but it is Mm -hmm. not simple. That's right. And so, first of all, that was beautifully explained. Thank you so much, Paul. Mm -hmm. Secondly, let's talk about the role of leverage in all of this. Mm. So we've talked about the overall size of just the basic investments in this thing. How does leverage work for a hedge fund that is a distinguishing factor versus, I'm like leading you very hard with this question, obviously, but versus a traditional asset manager? Yeah. So leverage is is like electricity, which is, is a super useful, wonderful thing. It's allowing us to have this conversation. And if you stick your finger in the socket, you will die. <laughs> I love that's, that. that's that's what leverage is. Yeah. And that's by the way, to my kids. people people use leverage all the time. Oh yeah, we talk about buying. Ha- I mean, I'm a real estate agent by day, so we talk about how right. everyone's buying oh, yeah. their own little leverage portfolios my, with their houses. Read my most recent post. There's one one post ago was about housing, and with literal case examples of the houses mm-hmm. I've bought and sold. So leverage is something that people are using mm-hmm. all the time. Uh, the typical mm-hmm. homeowners levered about ten to one. If they which is huge, by the way. Which is <laughs> yeah, insanely is, it's high huge leverage. leverage. Yeah. And so people are accustomed to yeah. leverage. All right, how does leverage work yeah. in, uh, in, in a hedge fund? Again, there's hedge funds that have blown up because they've stuck their fingers in the socket. And mm-hmm. then there's the ones that don't blow up you don't really hear about. Mm-hmm. But the basic mm-hmm. reason you're using leverage in a hedge fund is to make investments have roughly similar impact. And I'll give you an example of that. The Japanese stock market, or I'll take an even more extreme example. If you're taking the Japanese bond market compared okay. to the U.S. bond market. Sure, sure, sure. The Japanese bond market moves like this. The U.S. bond market moves <laughs> Paul like is this. moving his hand say, yeah, in a, a very lot. tiny uh, – right. he's, he's showing us the relative volatility, that there's minimal volatility One in right. Japanese little, bond market bit, relative to the other hand is the much more. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, exactly. The, US, the Japanese bond market really doesn't move a lot. It's relatively It hasn't stable. for the last 20 years. That's right. The U.S. Yeah. bond market moves a ton. Okay. What if you want to put on a trade or we sophisticated say is you want to make an asset allocation decision based on these two things? <laughs> mm-hmm. It's really a trade. Well, you want them to have similar impact. Mm. Why? Because if you're betting, say, that interest rates in Japan are going to rise and interest rates in the United States are going to fall, and mm-hmm. that's the trade you're doing, mm-hmm. well, you might be right, but Japanese interest rates might rise only by like – 10 basis. I don't want to use all the jargon. It no, might no, no, only you're fine. We've covered 10 basis points. points. Yeah, yeah, It'll yeah. only okay. rise by a very small amount. Mm-hmm. And the U.S. buy a lot. And this creates problems. So mm-hmm. you're using leverage 
to basically make these portfolios the same. And I'd say even more on this, the leverage is just a tool that depends on what the client wants. Mm -hmm. So if you want me to build a great portfolio that has 5% volatility, Mm -hmm. so not much at all, there ain't any leverage at all. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, I could buy, one investment I could buy, I could buy US stocks, which have about 15% leverage. Mm -hmm. And as opposed to putting $100 in those stocks, I could put $5 in them and put $95 in cash and call that US stocks and it's going to have very little volatility. So you're just using leverage. It's like cooking. Like some things have a stronger spice than others. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're using a lot of salt, you better be careful because it's going to drown out the basil. Mm-hmm. And so you got to make these things so they have roughly similar impact to make the thing hang together in a good way. And then talk about, so you came in in such an unconventional path to mm-hmm. the hedge fund space. Can you talk a little bit about what a career path might look like for someone who's trying to break into the hedge fund world, whether it be a college student right now who, like the three of us, comes from you know a non-traditional background, someone coming from the banking side looking to make a move to the buy side, um, or someone coming from an entirely different industry, again, like you did, looking to explore that? Yeah. So what I do, I create a spreadsheet. And the first thing I do on the spreadsheet is basically write down, like, what are the functions that make a hedge fund go? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you need to raise the assets, that's salespeople. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You need to trade the assets, that's traders. You need to research what the heck you're doing, so that's mm-hmm. analysts. Then you need portfolio managers. And the compliance is super complicated on this stuff, so you need a whole compliance and legal department. Mm-hmm. And then you need an HR department where you're hiring and firing people, and then you need tech to make it run. Mm-hmm. So those are basically the ingredients. All those things, that whole team is required to get the thing to operate. Mm -hmm. That's on one thing. And then I think a little bit about where you as a person slot in. Like, what type of person are you? Salespeople, the good salespeople are, I guarantee you, if you cat scan their brains, they're very different than the analysts. Mm -hmm. And this is is something I'm also talking about in this money book, which is that school doesn't really teach you what type of person you are. Uh But there's hints if you listen. Like, really listen to yourself. What type of hobbies did you do? What You know, are you somebody who loves to work? Like, you two are doing this thing together. So you're more of a, you know, a social type of thing. A pack animal. A, a pack <laughs> animal. Yeah, are you more of a pack animal? Are you a little bit more of the scientist who wants to sit there, you know, working on the equation for two mm-hmm. years type of thing? So you got to know a little bit about what type of person there are. There are a lot of clues in your habits. And think about where you would slot into that. And then put yourself in the shoes of somebody running the hedge fund, which is, you know, you know, what are they looking for? They're looking for smart, scrappy people that will fit in that. Uh, it's a little bit like an orchestra. Mm-hmm. The portfolio manager is the conductor, but they need a good violin player. They need somebody else who's getting you know, the bassoon type of thing. So figure out where you are in there and then slot in. So the first thing I would think about is what's a hedge fund? Like mm-hmm. break it down to its key elements. Who are you? Break that down yeah. to your key elements. And then on the next tab of the spreadsheet, I would make a list of all the different hedge funds. Like, Mm -hmm. what are they like? What do they do? What are their specialties? Blah, 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 blah. How are they structured? Different ones are going to be structured different ways. And then I would just reach out to them. The people running them are just regular people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think about them as, oh, you know, they're they're so wealthy that blah, 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 you know, type of thing. First of all, a lot of them are struggling like crazy. It's really hard work, often very unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for help. And so write to them and ask. Now, the vast majority of people are not going to answer you. Sure. But who cares? <laughs> all who it takes cares? is one. It's all it takes is one. Exactly. And so just reach out to them and then have a conversation and see where it goes and take it from there. And the other thing I'd very much focus on is, at least in my perspective, you got to be really, really hungry for the knowledge mm-hmm. on its own. Mm-hmm. Like, I honestly, I never got into any of this stuff for money. Like, I needed to raise kids and stuff like that, but that was not what was motivating me. My initial thing is, why did the Soviet Union collapse? Intellectual curiosity. You were, yeah. wanted to understand, like you yeah. said, you wanted to understand how the world works. Yeah. Exactly. And then mm-hmm. currencies, and then putting on it, and I was like, the Canadian dollar. Now I'm really nervous. Like, okay, this emotion is really a big deal <laughs> that I have to deal with too. Okay, so let's study yeah. the brain and neurology and Kahneman mm-hmm. and blah, 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 all that type of stuff. So each one of those things, but it, it requires like that curiosity and listening to yourself and saying, what is the question I'm wrestling with right now? 
And I think if you do that, you will find, eventually you'll find your path there. And it's a very interesting career, but it ain't easy. Well, I was going to ask you, what do you think is the biggest misunderstanding or misperception of the hedge fund world among, you know, easy. other listeners? No. That uh-huh. it's easy. So one of the people, I mean, people have different views of him, but I've met him a number of times, uh, George Soros. Mm-hmm. I think Soros is a genius. Mm-hmm. And Soros retired when he was roughly my age. He's one of the mm-hmm. most successful hedge funds. And the reason is the stress killed him. He was in his 50s and he was like, if I keep doing this, this is absolutely brutal. If I keep doing this and I die, like to what end? You know, he's obviously way, way wealthier. Than, he made way more money than I ever did. In, oh, we don't know, Paul. <laughs> the, um, the stress killed him and he's a pretty tough guy. Mm-hmm. Like Warren Buffett will not short stocks. Mm-hmm. Warren Buffett's yeah. a very wealthy guy, but it's too stressful. Yeah. Like this yeah. is really, it, it's a really hard thing. And a lot of... Mm-hmm. The investors who I know well over the time, they are in pain, not a small percentage of their life. It's a little bit like if you know yeah. super elite athletes. Mm-hmm. Like if you see them win the gold medal, you're like, wow, I'd like to be an Olympic skier. <laughs> well, talk to people that are actually doing that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. You know, it's right. like two back surgeries, knee replacement, three concussions. <laughs> and da, da, da. Like this happens yeah. to people yeah. who are in that competitive a field and it's tough. So I right. think that you can't invest well unless you have a pretty high tolerance for pain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And living with pain constantly is hard. Yes, you get the, if you're successful, you get these financial rewards, but people pay a lot more attention to the successes than they do the, not even, there's monster blow ups like in 1990. But then there's like the also rands, right? Like, yeah, and there's that, a lot of failure too. Yeah. And imagine yeah. that working really hard, being in pain as opposed to, 48% of the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you're really good, you're in paid 48% of the time. Right, right, and right. And if you're bad, you're in paid 52% <laughs> of the time. <laughs> right. Like, what's no, that like? That's exactly yeah. right. I was laughing when you were talking about the pain. I kept wanting to jump in with the pain sponge. Did you guys watch the From last succession? Of, yeah, I was seeing the last yeah, no, the no, pain, the pain sponge. It was too, honestly, we watched some succession. It was too, it was a little bit too close to home and was too it? painful for me and I was just like was it? this is not entertaining that's, that's how I feel like, about all too, like too the too big, big to, fail. to yeah. fail I'm like people are like oh have you watched it I'm like no I lived it I don't need to see a dramatization of my 20s like I'm good yeah <laughs> um so I don't know if this is connected at all but I'm curious about what led to your transition out of the hedge fund space <laughs> hopefully it wasn't hopefully it wasn't 52 percent pain that led to the transition out um knowing was, a little was, bit about was, you I think it was just that intellectual curiosity looking for the next uh, way to I th- scratch I think that that's itch. right. It was, it was a couple different things. First of all, it's just an awareness of mortality. Mm. I'm an emotional person, but I'm also an analytical person. And so I'm 55 now. I left Bridgewater when I was 52. Mm-hmm. When I was 52, I literally just went on the Social Security website. Instead, uh, statistically, how long am I going to be alive for? Mm-hmm. And I forget the exact number, but I Why think the answer was... Why would you do this was, thing? Was <laughs> I know. It was like 360 months. Oh my God. Oh my God. 360 oh. months. And I was like, okay. What? No, no, no. It must have been more than that. The, um, whatever it was, it was 30 plus. 20 yeah, months. it was like 400, 400 months, yeah. something like that. But it wasn't still that. Still that many months. It wasn't that many. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, and yeah. I was like, I was like, how do I want to spend these next 400 months? Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was part of it. It was an analytical question. The Paul, other you said was, you have kids? How old? How old? My kids are, they're just about to turn 29 this week and 23. Oh, that's so they're, great. they're full on adults. Uh-huh. Um, that was part of it. The other thing was, is I'd sort of been in this evolution, like journalist to banker to hedge fund, but I'd always worked for somebody else. Mm. I really, really, really wanted to work for myself. I wanted to see what that whole experience was. You know, Ray Dalio, the, the founder of Bridgewater, and I spent a lot of time together and he had a big influence on me, but he is a classic entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted that experience. And then the last thing was around the time I was leaving Bridgewater, I published my first book, which is a nonfiction book about being a parent. And can you share with us the the name of that book? So our listeners can go find it. The first book is called Raising a Thief Uh about being a parent. (laughs) The second book is a fiction book. It's actually a financial thriller. If they want to understand what this world is like in a more entertaining way, it's Master Minion. And then I have a sub stack uh, called Things I Didn't Learn in School, which is also related to money. That's right. But the, um, the book about being a parent, I put it out there and I began to get a response back from readers that was super powerful. 
for me to see what that thing was like. That there, mm-hmm. you know, there's different forms of compensation you can get in the world. Yeah. And money matters. But that thing was, I saw somebody on the street who actually still works for uh, Bridgewater. And she was there with her husband. She was pushing a young baby. And I just rolled down the windows. I drove by and I was like, hey, how you doing? She goes, good. You know, and I got introduced the baby. And she said, I read your book. She goes, it really changed the way I'm parenting her. Oh, and I, I was like, that. wow, that's what I wrote it for. So that, that... That emotional fulfillment. Yeah, it was like a totally different thing, like communicating with the audience. You know, we started jabbering about Taylor Swift, but it's like, yeah. <laughs> I hate Taylor Swift, but there's, there's a connection with the audience you get through creating that's really powerful Mm -hmm. and I liked Mm -hmm. it and I was sort of trying to figure out how I could evolve in that direction and how did your podcast evolve uh good question so the the first book you know it has a very evocative title Raising Uh a Thief uh we have uh two kids one biological one adopted the adopted one was a super hard challenge Uh and we that's what the book is about and when I was at book clubs and book talks people kept saying what does your daughter think what does your daughter think so I finally said to my daughter, listen, can I just record a conversation with you? Because everybody's asking this question. Nobody quite believes my answer. So let me just record it. I said, literally, I think like three people in the world are going to listen to this. Uh-huh. <laughs> but at least it'll be out there. And when I'm at a book talk, I can have a reference. And I put it out there and people began downloading it all over. And I was like, podcasts, pretty powerful. <laughs> New way of getting information. Maybe I'd experiment with this. That's and right. then it just grew from there. And like you, I found the conversations super. So I just attached a podcast to my essays and I found that they're super powerful. And, you know, my first thing started out with sort of my life lessons as a parent, but I found that every, I'm sure if I interviewed you two, everybody has interesting life lessons that they didn't learn in school. And here's what's weird. They haven't been the same so far. I've interviewed Mm -hmm. over 50 people. Everybody answers the question differently. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, now that's interesting. And I find that that's a great sort of thing to add into the the essays. So it's a lot of fun. Oh, that's phenomenal. When it Um, works. (laughs) There's also pain too. Hopefully not 48% of the time pain. That's true. (laughs) Um, What are your next kind of personal and professional goals from here? I just want to grow the Still Press things. We've got a small staff. We've got books. We've got essays. Can you tell our listeners what Still Press is? So Still Press is basically the company that does all this that Mm -hmm. I created. Mm -hmm. And the name Still... It still means two things. It's very calm, but it's also where you produce moonshine. So it starts to be calm (laughs) things that sort of are mind altering. So we've got books, we've got podcasts, and we've got an essay. The essay, there's a free version, there's a paid version. The paid version literally ties to my investing. Mm -hmm. So for people who are interested and they want to see like, how does a hedge fund manager go through the world? It's literally like, here's what I'm doing. Here's what's worked. Here's what's hurt. Blah, 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 that type of thing. Oh, I love that. And here's what I'm thinking about the world now. And that includes like Russia, Ukraine, China, all that type of stuff. Uh huh. So I would just like to keep growing that thing. It's growing. I'm sure you guys have experienced the excitement of starting something and watching it go down to the world. I'm not longer, much longer to this journey than you two. And I'm trying to figure it out and get it to grow. Mm-hmm. You know, the tricky thing about what we're both doing is that people only have so much time in the day. Mm-hmm. So for you to succeed and me to succeed... We need to get them to stop doing something they were doing and start paying attention to us. Mm-hmm. Tough yeah. business. <laughs> Think about scale. It's different than managing money. So That's right. I still really like managing money, my money. I'm kind of skittish about ever taking on client money just because mm. I was in yeah. that world for so long. And I'm not sure I could continue to do my other creative stuff if I was doing that at the same yeah. time. So. Yeah. There's only so many hours of the day. We have learned that I there know. are never enough. It, life can be so full and so exciting when you have these things that are, I yeah. think, emotionally fulfilling. I totally. think I there's never enough hours in the day for that. I have a very finite set of hours in the day for the things that are only financially rewarding and not yeah. emotionally <laughs> rewarding at this point in our lives. Uh, yep. And that's how we ended up here. <laughs> Well, Paul, I mean, this has just been unbelievable. I mean, you've set the bar way too high for the rest of our podcast <laughs> going forward. Um, do you have any kind of final thoughts or questions you'd like to ask us or pose to our listeners? I would just say that one way or another, you're going to have to develop a relationship with money. Uh-huh. Like it's going to impact you whether you like it or not. So try to think about it thoughtfully the same way you would like what's your practice around exercise or food or relationships it's one of these building block areas for life and 
it's just as hard as those other areas to figure out what works for you, what works for the people mm-hmm. around you. So allow yourself to go on that exploration and allow yourself to know that it's confusing mm-hmm. because it ain't, yeah. it ain't simple, just like all the good things are not simple. Oh, no, that's yeah. great. Well, listen, Paul, thank you. Do you have a, a website or a social media account that we can share with our listeners so that they can follow you? That's at Paul underscore Podolsky on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to The Wall Street Skinny. We are more than just a podcast. So follow us on TikTok and Instagram at The Wall Street Skinny. If you're a visual learner, we have content that will help get you up the curve from valuation to Excel to Bond Fundamentals 101. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where we will be publishing in-depth tutorials on all this and more. 